Good evening, Ron. We we're talking about our power outage. Some of us lost power for a few minutes, and some of us, like me, lost it for about an hour today. Yeah, I think my, my wife was home today, and I think um, she lost it for at least an hour in our house yeah. on Warrenville. Yeah. But she used it as an excuse to get um, our four-year-old loaded up and drive him over to um, uh, North Garage on the Yukon campus to watch more heavy construction equipment in action. <laughs> it's, it's, become, yeah. it's becoming a weekly... Uh, a weekly jaunt. Yeah. Great thing for a kid. Yeah. Yeah. He he seems pretty enamored. She'll send me a picture or two from like behind and he just is glued. He's transfixed. <laughs> well, we're gonna need more Democrats. We're not gonna have all our we aren't gonna have any Republican at the beginning and Alfred Tully will be joining us around eight, he said. Oh. Are they okay? But, Charlie, uh, and Charlie and David both separately have said they're under the weather. Oh, too bad. Either one of them would tell me what the under the weather meant, but... Yeah. I know that David hasn't been well all weekend. Mm. Ryan, what time would that flag raising be on Friday? Nine thirty, I think, is tentatively when they're targeting. I have a, a doctor's appointment at nine in Glastonbury, and I don't know whether it's going to be a virtual or an in person. I suspect it's going to be in person. Okay. Um, uh, I. Right. Okay. Um, when's the yeah. earliest you think you would be able to be back if it's an in-person appointment? Eleven is the early nine. I'll uh, I'll alert Glenn so we can talk things over. Hey Ben. We need two more council members. Ron, Sam, here we go. We got a quorum. Uh, are we ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. This is June 14th, and this is the regular meeting of the Mansfield Town Council. The night before our town meeting, which is Tuesday, June 15th, at 6 o'clock at the Mansfield Middle School in our regular place. So we look forward to seeing everybody who can be there. Um, it will be our first in-person gathering. There will be uh, plenty of uh, space, and we will have people spacing out either in the auditorium or if that overflow is needed in the cafeteria, or if people wish to remain in their cars, they will be able to stay in their cars, uh, but they should have an electronic device to watch streaming, and, uh, and when they come in and register, we will explain the procedures for the evening. So I, I hope everybody plans to be there, or at least enough to get the budget passed, whichever uh, is more important. Um, but it will be an interesting time for, for people to get some of the questions answered about what's been going on with the town and with the town's money. So with that, um, the first item on business is the call to order. Ms. Chang, could you call this meeting to order, please? I, I'm sorry, call the roll. Yes, Osberger. Mr. Osberger has asked to be excused because he is not feeling well. Thank you. Berthelot. Here. Bruder. Here, I'm just sitting on my light. Fratoni. Mr. Fratoni will be joining us later. Freudman. 
Mr. Freudman is not feeling well tonight. Kotchenberger. I can see him. Moran. Here. Shuren. Here. Shaken. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kotchenberger is uh, having technical difficulties and is signing out and will return shortly as soon as he can get in. Okay, thank you, everybody. The next item on our agenda is approval of the special meeting draft minutes of May 18th, 2021. Do I hear a motion to approve? A motion moved by Ms. Berthelot. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Bruder seconds. Are there any comments, corrections? Um, hearing none, is there anybody who wishes to oppose the passage of the minutes of May 18th? Is there anybody who wishes to abstain? I rule the moon. The motion has been passed unanimously. The next item is are the regular minutes of our regular meeting from May 24th. Is there a motion to approve? Ms. Berthelot, is there a second? Mr. Bruder seconds. Comments, corrections, changes? Anybody wish to abstain? Anybody wish to object? Passed unanimously. Uh, allergies are coming. If I sneeze, excuse me. Uh, next item is the public hearing on Neighborhood Assistance Act programs. Ms. Shane, would you please read the call to the hearing? Yes. The Mansfield Town Council will hold a public hearing at 7 p.m. on June 14, 2021, virtually via GoToMeeting to solicit comments regarding potential program applications to the Neighborhood Assistance Act program. Information regarding the potential program applications is on file at the town clerk's office for South Eagleville Road, Mansfield, and is posted on the town's website, mansfieldct.gov, dated at Mansfield, Connecticut, this 8th day of June, 2021. Mr. Aylesworth, do you want to present this? Uh, do you, or, or Ms. Painter? I would gladly turn it over to Ms. Painter. Welcome, Good evening. Pa Good evening. So uh, I, I believe as many of you are aware, uh, the Neighborhood Assistance Act program is run by the state of Connecticut uh, out of the, I believe it's the Division of Revenue Services. And it has, it's basically a program that allows businesses uh, that owe uh, certain types of corporate taxes to obtain a tax credit uh, for donations to programs that benefit um, nonprofit agencies as well as communities. Uh, there are two different types of tax credits. One is an ener for energy conservation projects. You can receive a tax credit of up to 100% of the investment that you make in that program. Uh, and then for community programs, uh, it's a tax credit of 60% of the investment. And there's a, a wide range of programs that may qualify, including community-based alcoholism prevention, treatment, neighborhood assistance, job training, community services, crime prevention, construction or rehab um, of affordable housing units, uh, child uh, care facilities, um, and programs that basically serve people that are at least 75% at least of whom are at an income level that does not exceed 150% of the poverty level for the preceding year. The town has been applying to this program um, for many years now, I believe dating back to um, 2011 or 2012. Uh, you have received in your packet four projects uh, that are proposed for submission. The, the town is required by the state to approve uh, any applications that are submitted. Uh, so what you will see is that there is one application from the town itself uh, for the water harvesting project at the Mansfield Community Center. Uh, as you can see in the uh, memo that's provided, this project has received approximately $36,000, a um, little over that in funding from the NAA uh, in previous years. Um, we're continuing to seek funds uh, to help us get to the point where we can uh, both design the system and then hopefully actually install it. 
Uh, we do have three applications, and I will say one is a little bit different because it lists the town as a co-applicant. That is from the Mansfield Discovery Depot. They are seeking $82,576 to replace 67 windows uh, in that building. And the, I, so I believe that they have listed us as a co-applicant uh, due to our ownership of the building. So one thing to note is that uh, the town has uh, in the past submitted multiple applications and we can do so whether or not they're accepted is up to the Department of Revenue Services. However, uh, we are limited uh, to receiving $150,000 in any given year. Um, I will also note that that has never been an issue in the past. I think the most that we may have received through uh, for individual projects probably hovers around nine or ten thousand dollars, and I'm not sure we received that concurrently in the same year. The other applications that we received from nonprofits uh, after our solicitation was we received one from the Mansfield Nonprofit Housing Development Corporation. They are seeking $150,000 uh, to assist in acquisition of solar panels for the Eagleville Green mixed income development. Uh, and that the purpose of that is to help them reach their goal of zero, net zero emissions. And the final application that we have received is from Natchog Hospital. Uh, they are requesting $6,176, and this is for acquisition of smart boards, smart TV, it, TVs, and client therapeutic devices to assist with substance abuse disorder services, alcohol prevention, education, and treatment, and intervention services at Satcham House. So uh, we are required, uh, pursuant to the Neighborhood Assistance Act program, to hold a public hearing, which is what we are doing right now. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Am I correct that we can only receive 150,000, but we can apply for as much as we want? Correct. So we can. So yeah, we can apply for more. We can't. Presumably, if we ever got to that, you they would cap us. Um, again, it's it's really never been an issue from us. Um, in looking through past awards, it looks like you know cities such as Bridgeport, Hartford, some of those organizations um, in the in the projects in those cities do get up into the tens of thousands of dollars, uh, but that is not something we've seen in Mansfield. Um, and so just, it, it's something just to be aware of, but again, not something we've actually ever seen where we, we came close to that amount. Mr. Sheridan. Yeah, so they can make a partial award for one or another of these projects, not the full amount asked for? Correct. So biz businesses themselves um, are limited to, I think the minimum um, contribution is $250 uh, and the maximum that they can do in any year, calendar year is $150,000. Mm -hmm. In looking, so every year the um, Department of Revenue Services does publish a list of projects uh, in the funding that they received. And what you typically see is the businesses are spreading those donations to multiple projects in multiple communities, depending mm -hmm. on where they do business. There may be some that are focused, if they're really in one community, they may put it all towards one project or one community. But many times you'll kind of see that same business name scattered throughout that list of communities and, and, and credits that they're taking. Uh, Mr. Kotcherberger, did I see your hand wave? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'm sorry if you already mentioned it, Linda, but um, have we ever received or any of the projects we recommended received approval and or funding, or business funding? <laughs> We, we have received funding. So um, two projects that the, so the water harvesting project through, um, I think from 2012 to tw 2019, received $36,144.71 um, from various uh, contributors. We also received um, some assistance with helping uh, do energy improvements uh, for uh, some of our lower income residents. Uh, we typically have been using that as leverage uh, when we do our housing rehab program. If, if someone is uh, having an issue in terms of needing a little bit more funding and they're doing windows or something else, we'll use that um, when we're capped out on our small cities funds. And I, I'm happy to say that I believe that one of our projects, either in 2019 or 2020, uh, a Montessori school asked for I want to say around $4,000 for windows. They received the full amount. Those windows went in and it is done. Um, so 
<laughs> you know, that I think one of the things that we've seen in Mansfield is the smaller the amount, the more likely you are to, to maybe be successful with that. You know, you can ask for 150,000, but the, you know, to get that type of money, um, may be more difficult. Uh, I will also note that, you know, as a government agency, we really can't go around and to businesses and say, hey, will you please consider, apply, you know, doing this donation, whereas a nonprofit organization may have that ability to kind of go to their members, you know, and do more proactive outreach once the project is approved. Right. Okay. Uh, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Painter? Mr. Aylesworth, do we have uh, members of the public who wish to speak on, at this public hearing? Um, I would defer to Tasha. I was out this uh, later in the afternoon. Tasha may be aware of members of the public that she didn't have a chance to, to brief me on yet. So, Tasha, if you're there and listening. Um, yes, we did not get contacted by any members of the public for the public hearing topic. All right. Given that there seems to be nobody to speak to this pub on this public hearing, I will declare the public hearing closed. Okay. The next item on our agenda is the opportunity for the public to address the council. This is open to anybody to speak on any issue. Uh, there is a five-minute limit. Um, please state your name and address. and. Um, and be civil. And so, is there anybody here to speak in public comment? I would again defer to Tasha if she's been made aware of any folks here speaking in public comment. Um, no, the two um, people that we have in the meeting that are not uh, town employees are for agenda items. Okay. Well, then I will declare the opportunity for the public to address the council closed. Uh, and we will move to the report of the town manager, Mr. Aylesworth. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as always, no shortage of things going on, so I'm just going to touch on a, a few items I think that are worth highlighting. Um, as you started the meeting by saying, we have our town meeting tomorrow, and there's been a lot of um, I dotting and T crossing in terms of um, sort of final hour planning for town meeting tomorrow. Obviously, this is a a town meeting that's a little bit unlike others in terms of uh, the, the, the format being um, offered to promote uh, good public health outcomes while at the same time maximizing ability for our residents to participate in this democratic process. So hopefully uh, we'll have a robust turnout and hopefully um, you know, as many members of our community um, that are able will, will come and participate in the process. Um, on June 9th, uh, the council has been made aware of this by email, but I just want to state it for the record. The Connecticut General Assembly uh, did approve um, the biennial budget. And one of the things to highlight in there for the town was uh, the, the state's biennial budget did preserve a enhanced level of uh, payment in lieu of taxes, pilot funding um, that, uh, that would increase our um, annual pilot revenue from a little over $8 million to about $13 million. It's roughly $4.8 million swing. Um, however, that increase, uh, and that's $4.8 million in each of the two years, um, that is uh, contingent on um, state sales tax revenues coming in um, where they've been forecasted as well. So um, while things look pretty good and, and on the right track at this point, um, it's still not, uh, at least the way I look at it, is 100% for sure thing, but certainly um, that statutory change in the pilot funding formula and the fact that um, the state's approved budget uh, preserved these uh, these increases that would have significant benefits to our community being the home of UConn um, is, is definitely worth pointing out. And hopefully uh, things continue to progress in, in the direction that they, they seem to be progressing. Um, on June 11th, I participated in the media event that was uh, hosted by Congressman Courtney. Um, as you all know from previous briefings, the town submitted a request um, in response to a solicitation from the Congressman's office for federal earmark funding. Um, we advanced a project in each of the two funding areas. One was under the transportation bill and one was under the appropriations committee. Um, the, uh, the transportation infrastructure uh, funding requests uh, pertain to 
a uh, construction of uh, about 4,800 linear feet of new sidewalk that would start at Tower Loop Road um, on Route 195 and extend up to the Four Corners. And um, our, our funding request uh, was favorably reviewed by Congressman Courtney's office. We were one of about 10 projects, I believe, that he advanced on behalf of the district. And it appears right now, um, we are now one of six projects that have, have um, uh, emerged um, that's contained within the House uh, Transportation Bill as it stands now. So the, the legislation still has a long way to go. Um, uh, we'll go through the Senate reconciliation process. We don't really know what the outcome will be, but appreciate uh, Congressman Courtney obviously uh, lending his support to this project and uh, for the invitation to participate in the, the um the media event, the virtual media event that he hosted last week so that we could join with other towns uh, like Coventry and, and share our project and, and, and talk it up. We think it'll be quite transformational for the for the community and in particular for the Four Corners area and, and certainly uh, from a public safety standpoint, um, a, a enormously beneficial project to be able to link uh, the Four Corners with, with the downtown and, and, and the Yukon campus. So hopefully, um, the many virtues of the project will, will help ensure that it ultimately does get federal funding um, because in addition to the economic you know, benefits, the, the public safety benefits, there's also a um, environmental sustainability benefit, you know, encourages more people to walk and bike from A to B as opposed to getting in their cars and drive. So um, hopefully our, our 10 foot wide multi-use trail um, from Four Corners to um, the sort of northern end of the Yukon campus will be successful. Um, on, a, on the related topic of earmarks, um, you'll recall our second project, um, which didn't ultimately receive a recommendation from Congressman Courtney's office. That was the intersection redesign um, project for the intersection of uh, Storrs Road 195 and Warrenville Road uh, Route 89. Um, we have resubmitted that to um, Senator Murphy's office. And so we'll see if the result is any different uh, going through the senator's office, uh, fingers crossed, but that's a very important project from the standpoint of the new school that's being developed and our expectation of what the new school uh, will mean for traffic patterns in that, that, air, that part of town. Um, earlier this month, uh, myself and the human resources uh, director uh, participated in a kickoff meeting uh, with the Civil Service Employee Association, uh, CSEA, representation as part of um, basically the early stages of our uh, negotiations on the two expiring union contracts that C CSEA serves as representation uh, for. Um, that would be the professional and technical union as well as DPW. Um, had a good initial meeting. Um, our planned uh, second meeting was actually for this week, um, but we had to postpone, um, do some changing availability on the C CSEA side. Um, so we're looking to regroup in the month of August and keep that process going, um, hopefully smoothly and successfully. Um, our conversion, the town's conversion to a new financial management software, Munis, is in an advanced stage right now. Um, myself and other staff, uh, department heads, um, as, as well as those that are um, submitting um, entries for approval in the system, um, are all going through about three hours uh, of training right now on how to navigate the new software. Um, it's a tremendous tool with tremendous capabilities, and obviously there's going to be a significant learning curve uh, for all of us, but um, that, that conversion will essentially be fully uh, implemented by the end of this month, and hopefully it'll be uh, you know, enormously beneficial and tra transformational in terms of how we do business and how uh, just the ease in which we generate reports and and and, and complete complete um, our business di digitally. Um, we uh, will be talking in a department head meeting tomorrow. I want to get feedback from staff about the next phase of reopening municipal buildings. Um, one area I'm looking to get staff feedback on is um, the, the, the possibility to um, discontinue a mask requirement for vaccinated individuals. This is obviously something that we see uh, is very prevalent right now. Um, in some ways, uh, municipal buildings are some of the, the last holdouts in terms of having a mask policy, um, a pretty ubiquitous mask policy. And so I'm looking to get feedback from department heads at a staff meeting tomorrow, and I will inform the town council, keep you all abreast in terms of uh, where we go with our operations um, on, on that front. But clearly the, the trend 
across the economy, across the state is, is um, further lifting um, mass requirements. And so um, we have to be as responsive to those changes and changes um, in terms of um, public health risks as anybody. And, and I've obviously had many conversations with, uh, with Rob Miller uh, naturally about this as well. Um, the school building committee is finalizing its plans for a groundbreaking ceremony for the new elementary school um, that's going to be happening on June 24th at 3.30. Um, we've invited a number of key state and local dignitaries um, and other uh, sort of central stakeholders uh, to, to the, the gathering and um, looking forward to officially breaking ground in a public way on this, on this project. Um, as you all are likely aware, there are a number of higher profile um, projects at various stages of review with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, a couple of these are in the Four Corners area. Uh, one is the Villa at Four Corners. It's a pro proposed 358 unit multifamily development um, on Middle Turnpike between CVS and Key Bank. And other is Haven at Four Corners. That's a proposed redevelopment of the Holiday Mall uh, site. Um, and uh, that, that would uh, lead to just under 400 new apartment units and approximately 15,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, you know, again, um, this is a process and, and um, you know, let, let Linda could talk to you for hours about the nuances of, of the review at this point, um, but, uh, but certainly um, significant proposed new developments for our community that would have major implications for the Four Corners area if they, um, ultimately were approved and, and um, if construction on those projects ultimately move forward. Um, just a couple uh, final items. Uh, summer camps and summer program registrations have been positive. Uh, registrations are lagging behind. Um, this is in our Parks and Rec program. Um, are lagging behind where they would be in a non-COVID year, but um, it appears the registrations are increasing daily. And um, so we're, we're definitely encouraged by those trends. Um, and Parks and Recreation with support from Youth Services was awarded $25,000 from Connecticut, the Connecticut Department of Education uh, Summer Enrichment Expansion Grant Program. And funds will be used to provide limited free sessions at Camp Mansfield, uh, full day camp to qualifying families. Mansfield families are eligible if they're participating in the free reduced school lunch program. Um, and then I think the last thing I wanted to mention, and I think he's on the line with us today, um, this will be the council's last meeting uh, since um, the, the, the plan, I believe, is still to forego the second meeting in June. This will be the council's uh, last meeting in which uh, Sergeant Timmy is still um, on the docket as, as the resident trooper supervisor for the resident trooper's office. Um, we don't know uh, exactly where the selection process is going from here. As I said in my written report, um, it is uh, looking like things are kind of unstuck now. There was a, a, a two-week window for applications to come in, and I'm being told um, that the, the goal is to potentially be meeting with candidates uh, next week, and, and I believe I'll be a part of that. Um, but uh, before Keith um, bids, uh, you know, at least this, his job, if not the community, uh, officially farewell, um, and we are having a retirement party for Keith on June 22nd at 10 a.m. here at Town Hall. Um, wanted to have Keith come on so that the members of the council who may not be able to join in the retirement party uh, would be able to give him a proper, proper send-off. And Keith, not to put you on the spot, but if there's anything you want to say, uh, now's, now's your chance. And I guess I should be a little guarded now I invite that. But in all, in all seriousness... Um, I've only been here seven months, but it's been a real privilege to work with you. Um, I think the next uh, resident trooper supervisor is going to have some pretty big shoes to fill. And uh, I, I hope you won't be going too far because I'm sure I'm going to be reaching out from time to time with questions. No, absolutely. Um, first off, just want to thank everybody uh, in the town of Mansfield to include, obviously, the town council members. Um, you've made my life very, I won't say easy, but easier. Um, it's nice to work with you guys. It's nice to get, uh, to, to see such passion, um, not just for the town council members, but also most importantly, the department heads, um, that I've worked with during my tenure here. Um, they're, they're just great people. Everybody's is just so caring and so passionate about making better choices and, uh, improvements for everybody in the town. And, uh, I just, a, a huge thank you to you all for 
welcoming me with welcome art with big open arms and uh, allowing me to participate and be part of that change the last several years. Thank you very I've much. Got, I've got to say, the first time I met you, Sergeant Timmy, I thought, oh, Lord, they sent us one of the old guys. And then you opened your mouth and spoke, and I realized you weren't. So it, it has been a real pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, and you did step into some pretty big shoes yourself. So um, uh, you certainly have carried on uh, that responsibility admirably. Uh, anybody else have anything to say? I, Mr. Bruder. I've said it before, but I uh, will say it again because this will be the last opportunity to get to officially at a town council meeting. You know, Sergeant Timmy uh, was always available to, to, to talk, and I found <clears throat> his approach for things to, to be um, beneficial for me as, as somebody who's new on the town council, and uh, I'll definitely uh, miss being able to have him as somebody that I can go to and and work with. So thank you. Enjoy your time. <laughs> thank you. I will. <laughs> Ms. Berthelot. Thank you, Mayor. I know Sergeant Timmy and I bumped heads a few times, but um, I can say every moment I always knew you had the interest of the town at heart. And I so very appreciated the way you went about um, expressing yourself and but keeping everybody safe. Uh, I, over and over again, you told us about breaking up parties and, and about how important it was to make sure that everybody got home safely. And that meant, I know that was a lot of work, but that meant a great deal to me and I think to the town as a whole. So thank you so very much. Uh, thank you. Anybody, Mr. Kachenberger. Thank you. Um, yes, and I, I think one of the things, uh, the number, any number of things that uh, you appreciate is you were very impressive, but also simply the diplomacy. I mean, not only dealing with, you know, all of us, the town of Mansfield, but the state police, Yukon, um, uh, and the very, very populations that you have to police. And you did it with uh, a lot of tact and diplomacy, and I, I, I really appreciate that. And also just, you know, as you said, and as Terry just mentioned, the commitment, you know, not to arrest, but to get people home safely uh, and to use, you know, as really as a, you know, a, it's helping the community out when you, you know, when you could, and you did this repeatedly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're all very welcome. And I assure you, I'm not going to, uh, I, I shared with you, conversation with Ryan earlier. Um, you know, don't delete my contact number because I'm not deleting his. Um, and same with you. And I'll, I'll put that for all of you also. Um, and you can go through Ryan if you want, whoever, but I will still be available, make myself available um, for the next person that does uh, take over my position to help ease that transition and, and, so they're not reinventing the wheel, but the wheel needs to be changed and, you know, further moved to uh, better and, and bigger and better things. So I will be available, make myself available to that person along with Ryan and whoever else to share the knowledge I have and contacts and make those meetings uh, as amicable as possible so that they can, you know, you, you can, we can all agree to disagree, which is fine. But at the end of the day, we all have to say, have the same mission at the end of the road. And that is to, you know, keep everybody safe and, and, and make the community a better community than it was yesterday. So I think that's all that we can uh, pretty much strive for. Thank you. I think, I think that you have a, a person in your position has a real challenge in that a very large percentage of our community changes every four years, actually every mm -hmm. year. So what you have done in one year will have to be done all over again for the next batch. So uh, it takes a particular kind of patience and understanding to, to uh, manage that. So as well as dealing with our, with our full-time long-term population. So thank you. Anybody else? Well, I will see you at your retirement party, I believe. I appreciate it. And I'll see you also on the 22nd. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, Thank you all very much. Thank you, Keith. Um, that concludes uh, my report. I'm happy to field any questions about other uh, items I covered in my written report that I didn't speak to if the council has any questions. Any questions for Mr. Aylesworth? Hearing none, we'll move on to reports of council members. Uh, I will say that uh, we raised the flag, the pride flag, last week. Um, I have had a couple of emails thanking us for the uh, for the declaration of June as Pride Month. Um, we were fortunate; we had a lovely day to put the flag up, um, and so that was a really good thing to do. Mr. Shoren joined us for that celebration. Um, other than that, I I had an interview with John Murphy on the, the ECSU radio station. I think that there are a number of people who are expecting the council to to make a judgment and a, take a position on a number of planning and zoning issues. Uh, and I think we are, I have been saying that is not within our purview and uh, please don't ask us to do that. Um, and I hope the rest of the council will share uh, our hesitancy as a body. Of course, as a citizen, you can do whatever you want, but uh, if I think it's important that we stay out of the business of our fellow boards. Um, is there anybody else who has a report to make? Nope. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. There doesn't seem to be anything on the consent agenda, so we'll move right on to old business, and that is the neighborhood assistance program. Um, Mr. Aylesworth and Ms. Painter, uh, uh, let's see, we have a, a motion on page 17. Um, no, it's not there. It's page 19. Uh, 19. So, uh, uh, Ms. Berthelot. I'll make the motion. Resolved to approve the following projects for submission to the Connecticut Department of Revenue Services for inclusion in the 2021 Neighborhood Assistance Act Program, Water Harvesting Project at the Mansfield Community Center, Window, re window Replacement at Mansfield Discovery Depot, Acquisition of Equipment and Supplies for Natchog Hospital Sachem House, and Acquisition of solar panels for the Mansfield Nonprofit Housing Development Corporation's Eagleville Green Project. Is there a second to Ms. Berthold's motion? I see a second for Mr. Shuring. Um, discussion. We've had the public hearing, we've had the presentation. Does anybody have any further questions or anything they wish to say? I Mr. Shaken? I <clears throat> just having reviewed them in the packet without any participation in the hearing, I think they're all I think they're all good projects and worthy of our of our support. And this is a program we apply for every year. We generally are not awarded the full amount of funding for what we apply for. We're generally not awarded the I think the full hundred and fifty thousand if I'm remembering correctly, but um should we be able to access these funds? I think these are all worthy projects on which to spend them. Thank you, Mr. Bruder. I saw your hand. Thank you. I was just going to uh, say that I'm, I'm in favor of these two projects. Uh, not only am I... Um, there are more than two. I'm excited for all the projects. <laughs> I meant it as like the town's applying for one and the Mansfield Discovery Depot, but thank you. But the... Uh, uh, and that's what I was going to point out is that I like and appreciate that Mansfield Discovery Depot is applying or co uh, applying for their windows. I know that uh, I believe the roof being redone is in the budget. And so if this application goes through even a little bit towards, I think it's the windows, if I uh, understood the presentation correctly, it'll be good to have um, our investment in the, in the building as owners of as the town um, protected. And uh, for that, I'll be supporting this. Anybody else wish to comment on this? Is there anybody who wishes?
wishes to abstain from this vote? Is there anybody who wishes to object to the motion? Seeing no objections, I will rule that the motion has been adopted unanimously. The next item on our agenda is Mr. Miller and an update on COVA. Mr. Miller, welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I'll start off with... Uh, Rob, your, uh, your sound's a little muted. How about that? It's a lot better. better. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll start off with uh, uh, some uh, uh, some data uh, from the State Health Department. Um, the uh, we're um, eight weeks into a downward trend of total weekly case counts, uh, with uh, uh, the count of six as of June fifth, uh, uh, district wide uh, being the lowest count we've had in an individual week since uh, the beginning of August. So. Uh, <clears throat> Good news continues uh, in terms of that downward trend uh, within the town of Mansfield. Within uh, the the past week, again for the period uh, ending uh, June fifth, there was a count of two cases, and uh, again that's uh, that's low. Um, in terms of an incidence rate for the town, uh, that represents just under two cases per hundred thousand, as compared to the state of Connecticut uh, for this period, which is at two point four. Um, on the vaccination front, um, the health district has uh, administered uh, 10,058 uh, vaccinations as of June 9th at 106 clinics uh, district-wide uh, for the town of Mansfield. Uh, the total count of fully vaccinated individuals uh, from the record is 7,772, again, as of uh, November 9th. Um, in Connecticut, 52% of the um, uh, total population is fully vaccinated. Um, I believe, while I can't say for sure what the number is in Mansfield because it's hard, as I've said in the past, to, to uh, separate uh, UConn students from that number, I'm sure that the Mansfield number is higher than that. Um, we continue to uh, do uh, walk-up clinics at the Mansfield Community Center. We're gonna be uh, uh, transitioning uh, and moving uh, the walk-up clinic, uh, which is held uh, twice a week and Mondays and Thursdays to um, uh, the health district main offices in the Mansfield Town, town Hall starting um, uh, next week. Uh, we'll put out more information and messaging on that in the coming days. Uh, we continue to uh, uh, host pop-up clinics. We held one uh, June 3rd at United Services. Previous to that, we held one at Stores Adventure Park. I believe I mentioned that last time. And we also held one at the Coventry Regional Farmers Market this past Sunday, uh, which was uh, reasonably well received. And we're looking for more opportunities uh, in the communities to hold the pop-up clinics. Uh, so if anybody has any ideas, uh, please um, feel free to reach out to the Health District main office. And we continue to uh, provide uh, vaccine to those homebound residents uh, in our communities. Uh, the, those numbers are still trickling in and we'll continue to do them um, as uh, requests are made. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, answer any questions uh, councilmen and persons uh, may have. Oh, one final announcement. I apologize, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, you probably did hear that uh, the UConn Board of Trustees recommended that uh, um, all on-campus uh, in-person learning uh, for the fall 2021 20, semester uh, mandated uh, COVID-19 vaccinations for students. Um, so I'll leave it there. Do you have any way of, of superimposing your list of vaccinated people on the community in terms of ge geologic, geographic distribution? Uh, uh, you mean in terms of those uh, those vaccinated um, district wide for each yeah. town? Is that what you're? Yeah. I do. We we can get that information. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I'd be glad to share it with you. What I'm wondering is, are there apartment complexes, for example, where there are low vaccination rates, where it would make sense to do a pop up clinic? So, uh, so. Um, we have identified, um, for example, 
um, the Foster Drive area yeah, uh, right. as one as one area in which has been earmarked for pop up clinic. We are currently working uh, with the North Central District Department of Health, which is the Town of Wyndham Health Department, uh, to coordinate such an event um, because, as you know, uh, part of that complex is in uh, is in Willimantic. Uh, and so we'll be working with them and Hartford Healthcare, uh, an access agency, um, to do an intensive uh, outreach campaign within those within that housing complex, and direct uh, in, uh, direct individuals who are unvaccinated to those pop clinics. I hope to have more information on that in the coming days. How about how about other apartment developments like Meadowbrook or or um... Well, I assume the Oaks is pretty much. Yeah. Well, um, well the other, uh, it's yeah, we. It's hard to drill down and get those kinds of granular details within specific housing complexes. We do have data on uh, zip codes, uh, and so the zero six two five zero zip code, but it's a big one in the town of Mansfield. Um, but so, but to drill down uh, to more granular level. Uh, is difficult to do. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sharon. Can you just refresh my memory? What is the mask situation requirement? Is it at the discretion of proprietors of individual businesses? Is there still a state mandate? Any Anything on that? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So uh, the uh, uh, so um, governor's executive order uh, 12A, um, did stipulate universal masking is still required under certain uh, certain settings. And those include, um, I'm not sure I'm going to get them all, but the main ones are healthcare settings, uh, school building settings, uh, conjugate um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, housing shelters. Um, and there are, I believe, are one or two others, but there are still specific settings in which um, universal masking is, uh, is required. Beyond those settings, um, uh, the uh, mandate is for those who are unvaccinated indoors in public places shall wear a mask. But if a business wished to so require that anybody coming in must have a mm -hmm. mask, they are within That's the right correct. to do that. That's correct. That same executive order stipulates that any business owner um, or um, local government um, entity uh, can uh, require um, universal masking for anybody entering their facilities, regardless of vaccine status. Mr. Shaken. Hi, Rob. Thanks for your for your report. It's really awesome that these are getting. Uh, much much shorter than they were when we started them. Perhaps we might think about giving you your Monday nights back uh, relatively soon. Um, this may be a question for um, for Ryan or if Linda is still on the line uh, or it doesn't look like she has a follow up. Um, but there have been when people are sort of looking at the vaccine data in town. There's been some alarm because Mansfield has. If you look at the state's website, the lowest vaccination rate in the state. And um, as always, it's fairly unfortunate that the state with a limited data set can't come up with a way to fix that. But um, anyway, that's obviously not true. Um, it, is, it is, in fact, in reality what you said. But I'm curious if you um, know off the top of your head what your best guess is, what the estimate you would use for the sort of year round population of the town, given that it's not just that college students might be slightly less likely sure. than the general population for a vaccine, but mo none of them are living here right now, more importantly. Right. Well, the, the numbers I can share with you, as I said, uh, that, w that are, that are um, publicly available uh, is 7,772 individuals um, with Mansfield um, addresses that were provided to their vaccine providers um, are fully vaccinated. Um, couple that with um, information that uh, I acquired from uh, the 
uh, from uh, Linda Painter's office that had an estimate for the non-student permanent resident in the town of Mansfield, which is 9,741. Um, uh, certainly a segment of, certainly a portion of that 7,772 individuals fully vaccinated are UConn students. It's hard to say exactly what that number is, but I think individuals can draw their own conclusions given, um, given, uh, given the, um, uh, given the, uh, uh, um, given those two numbers in comparison, uh, 9,700 and 7,700. I suspect that, uh, uh, the seven of the of the seven thousand seven hundred seventy two, um, the number is go, of UConn students is going to be much lower. It's going to be a low percentage of that total number. Uh, uh, it's, as you aptly pointed out, it's unfortunate that we can't drill down a little bit more detail. The challenge or the reason um, it's hard to do that is because each individual provider that administers the vaccine. Uh, to an individual records the address that the individual provided that vaccine provider. So a UConn student has a temporary address from their perspective in stores. Many of them most likely used their their home uh, address when uh, when going to a vaccine provider and providing their and providing a address. They likely didn't provide their UConn address, and so then therefore it's not recorded. As you can, as a uh, Mansfield resident in the state data, or conversely, um, um, or conversely, you may have a population. We're also dealing with a population of younger people who, I think, by um, by comparison to other age groups, don't have a vaccination rate or vaccination coverage as large as some of the other age groups, like those uh, 65 to 75, for example. Yeah, I was wondering, Rob, whether the, these data were based on zip codes because UConn has a zip code, 06269, and my guess is that there's almost nobody who is an actual resident outside of kids in the dorm who have gone home. Uh, is there a zip code? Well, the uh, it's by town, and uh, uh, the data that's reported out uh, through the state health state health website is by town, um, and they do include all the zip codes uh, within that municipality border. Okay. Um, any other questions for Mr. Miller? Uh, I, uh, as we plan for our next meetings, I'm going to suggest to Mr. Ellsworth that until there is some kind of an uptick or some kind of a significant change in the rules, that we relieve Mr. Miller of his Monday night obligations. But that is something which we will need to dis discuss a little further before we make a, a natural decision. So it actually thank was my, I was just going to say, it was actually my thought, Madam Mayor, given that in July we'll be transitioning to in-person meetings, that that would be the natural cutoff. So I guess we could have made a bigger deal about this perhaps being Rob's last meeting for a while and really rolled out the red carpet and party favors, but uh, he's not going anywhere too far. Well, I assume he's going to come back in the fall as the numbers begin to climb up again. Exactly. Uh, Let's hope um, they don't climb up too much. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much, Rob, once again, and uh, have a pleasant rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Uh, good night, everybody. Hey, Rob. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the Martin Luther King Project. Um, I believe this is just a report. I don't think we have a vote. There actually is an action item on this there one. There is one on page 50. Yes. So I'll, with your permission, Madam Mayor, I'll turn this over to uh, Glenn Matoma. Glenn, as you all know, is the chair of the Human Rights Commission, and it's the Human Rights Commission that's really taken sort of an active role in at this point in shepherding this project along, although they're doing it in a very collaborative way with a wide range of community partners. Um, we're, we're excited to see this moving forward, and, and um, there's been a lot of discussion, as Glenn can perhaps uh, uh, detail a bit more about possible uh, sites, um, and, and the commission and the working group have uh, formally uh, are here to formally present a recommendation and request to the town council with respect to 
um, the site of the mural. But without any further ado, let me turn it over to Glenn. Great, thanks okay. so much. Great. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, happy to be in front of you. I know you've been tracking this project as we began it about a month ago. Um, and we've reached the point, uh, our first mile marker, which is the site selection. We have a recommendation for uh, prioritization of uh, potential sites for the, the mural. So as Ryan said, we've been engaged in a deliberative process with input from a variety of stakeholders. As a reminder, uh, the Human Rights Commission serves as the lead for this, but we have two key partners, Core Mansfield and the NAACP of Wyndham Willimantic as our core partners. And then we've sought input from the Arts Advisory Committee, um, the schools, uh, the library, and other potential interested groups in the, the work we were doing. So uh, we spent some time reviewing a variety of options for potential sites uh, in and around Mansfield, uh, ranging from the East Brook Mall to the um, uh, actually, we looked at the Mansfield Hollow Dam even. Uh, we're inspired by a work that was uh, done in, in Australia. Um, that, that proved to be a bit of a no-go. But, uh, but after reviewing a range of sites and talking about the pros and cons, about visibility, about accessibility, about community participation, about meaning for the, uh, the town as a whole and the region as a whole, uh, we settled on three that we prioritized and we ranked them according to our particular preference. The top a preference is the Mansfield Community Center. We felt this was centrally located in town and provided high visibility for a number of different community members, um, but was uh, set off the main drag so that there could be gatherings and other events in the, the kind of um, space in and around the, um, the mural. So that's our top choice. Our second choice is the E.O. Smith Building. Again, um, right in downtown. The added benefit of EO is it's a regional building and not just a town building. And so, uh, you know, we really want this to be something that a wider community is bought into, uh, again, given the participation of the, uh, the NAACP. Um, um, uh, and then um, the fourth, uh, the, the third choice is the, the Mansfield Library. And the library um, has going forward, again, a, a kind of uh, center of town feel, even though it's not literally in stores center, it's at the heart of our community. Um, that uh, 89 will become even more trafficked as the, the, the new elementary school gets, uh, gets built in there. Um, nice space and setting for a variety of community events. So we felt positively about all potential sites, um, but based on a range of parameters determined that our first choice would be the community center, the second would be EO, and the third would be the, um, would be the library. So our plan is, uh, should you all endorse this particular uh, ranking, uh, is to pursue, pursue the uh, community center with the intention of erecting mural there. If some unforeseen insurmountable uh, obstacle emerges with respect to the, uh, the community center building, uh, then we'll go to, the, to EO and begin the process there. But, uh, but we don't at this point, we've done some preliminary assessment and outreach uh, um, with which Ryan uh, and Jay have been really uh, um, uh, helpful with, and we don't anticipate any of those emerging. So our hope is um, that uh, that sometime in October we will be having an unveiling ceremony for the uh, for the, the the mural on the community center building. Um, there is a proposed revised amend uh, motion that appears in our chat. Um, staff has required uh, some language change, um, so I would request that when somebody makes this motion, they use the motion that's in the chat box rather than the motion that's in our agenda. Mr. Bruder. Uh, I'd, I'd make that revised motion if nobody has any questions. Uh, Mr. Shaken does. Uh, just a quick question for Ryan and the motion in our packet is for what I would call the front wall of the community center building. Like the, the, the wall you see as you drive up, there's three other ones, two of which are much more out of the way. So I'm wondering if there's a particular concern about the front wall and that might change what, and, and might that change what the HRC is hoping for with this mural? 
That's a, it's a good question. So let me let me speak to that. Um, the the facade that I think folks largely had in mind would be um, as you walk in, as you walk toward the the main entrance doors, immediately to the right, there's a large brick face basically uh, coming out to the corner of the building that's closest to town hall. And so it was on the the side of the the brick wall, that corner um, on the on the uh, main entrance side that that I think a lot of the discussion kind of centered on as far as the community building. However, uh, digging into it a little bit deeper and, and talking with Jay O'Keefe, the rec director, about how the building's used um, from a program standpoint, um, it was brought up that that same facade that I'm talking about now um, is often used, regularly used uh, for banners, for marketing, for outreach things, things that the community center is trying to bring people's attention to. And so there's going to be, I think, need to be more discussion around that. I think um, it's not that that's ruled out per se, but there would need to be more discussion around that. Um, in lieu of that, um, the discussion had been um, there's a, a larger brick facade, um, the facade that directly faces Town Hall. So um, basically, I guess, the eastern facing facade. Um, and, and that would be still viewable for anybody who's walking up to the main entrance doors, you still see that facade pretty clearly. It's just not on the inside corner, it's on the outside. Um, you'd see it if you're circling the parking lot or driving out the exit to the parking lot. Um, and you'd also have a much clearer view of it from um, EO Smith High School and the parking lot and the tennis courts. So so it is, you know, and then there's a sidewalk there too that kind of connects the, the sidewalk, I'm sorry, the parking lot of MCC to um, the tennis courts and, and EO Smith. So um, there needs to be more discussion around it. That's why the motion is proposed to be a suitable facade, realizing that there is more, um, you know, finer grain detail to be discussed. But I did, I did pose that same question, Ben, that you just asked um, uh, to to Glenn and confirm, got confirmation that even if we had to move away from that that one facade by the main entrance, that um, the belief is still that the HRC's support and enthusiasm for MCC as the home of the mural would not be diminished. It would not change the rank order of their preferences um, if that change was needed. But Glenn, anything else I left out? No, that's it. But I, I mean, I, I, this is true of all of the potential buildings. I think, you know, we recognize that as we get into the details, there may be contingencies that pull up. And, and it may also come from some input from the artist. The artist has not been selected. And so, uh, you know, some of that may uh, impact exactly which facade we uh, we choose. But I think we're, we're, we're working with the same set of objectives and parameters about the visibility, about its usefulness for the community. Um, and so, you know, we certainly don't want it in the back corner somewhere where no one's going to see it or be able to use it. Okay. Um, Mr. Bruder, you had the floor before Mr. Shaken asked his question. So do you wish to proceed? As long as there's no other questions, I'd be happy to make the motion. Are there any other questions? Please make the motion. Great. And uh, obviously this motion is being made with the idea that the Human Rights uh, Committee will, or Commission will uh, also approve of the, the new um, siding. Oh, look, there's, looks like there's a presentation. Well, not a presentation. It just occurred to me I could pull up the, the curbside view just because I know it gets a little complicated when we were talking about, you know, where the mural would go. And so if you can see my cursor, um, which I don't know if you can actually, but if you can, um, the facade just to the right of the entrance where there's a small sign, that was the original spot that was being contemplated. And then to the right of that with the sidewalk leading to the tennis courts where there are three small trees that look like they've been recently planted. It's a much longer facade. Um, there are some you know, rooftop downspouts to, to contend with. Um, but that would be another potential canvas. So I just thought I'd give people a visual. That was all. That would require mo removing trees, though. Okay. That that would require moving some, some trees. Um, I have not talked with anybody in grounds to know whether or not those trees would be, uh, would take well to being rehomed if they're resilient to that, but there, there would be some site modifications required to have an unobstructed view of the mural, correct? Okay. Right. So, your motion, Mr. Bruder, you 
I move to authorize the production of a Martin Luther King Jr. mural on a suitable facade of the Mansfield Community Center building. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Berthelot. And if uh, I could just, any further, I was just, gonna, I was just going to say that if this doesn't, if the Human Rights Commission and the, um, you know, uh, our town manager can't agree to the, the details of this, I would fully support them coming back with a, a different proposal for a location. Ms. Berthelot. Yeah, I simply want to echo what has already been said, that it's very important that this particular project doesn't get stuck in a corner and that uh, there needs the town, um, there needs to be some flexibility in thinking and, and prioritizing and that uh, it might be that we should think more about doing different way of advertising um, at, from the community center rather than the possibility of putting uh, this particular mural in a corner. But I understand that everybody's, I just, I'm sure that everybody at MCC is on board and, and will be flexible. And I'm hearing uh, from uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission that they too understand and are trying to be flexible, but just to say very, very strongly that, that this is an important project and that, uh, that when we're thinking, when we're trying to be flexible, that, that we should give a lot of priority to it. Agreed. Uh, just it seems to me also that the the, uh, the side of the building is less likely to be vulnerable to damage from people touching it, defacing it, walking right up right by it. Um, okay, uh, are we ready to vote? Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Anybody who wishes to abstain? The motion passes unanimously. All right, and, and thank you very much for the commission's work, Mr. Matoma. Um, thank you. Little did we know that we were gonna that your commission was gonna have so much to do, but uh, I kind of We really thank you for and the members of your commission for everything that's, that you've done so far, and there's more to come. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you, Glenn. You good too. evening. Okay, next item, we're moving on to new business. A briefing from the WRTD director. So I will uh, introduce uh, Linda Hateman and uh, her associate, uh, Philip Johnson. Linda is the still relatively new executive director. Can't remember exactly how new new is, but uh, she comes to us from Texas. Maybe she can tell us a little bit about her background and what brought her here, because I know there's a fun family story. Um, but uh, I had an opportunity to visit with um, with Linda and, and Philip uh, probably back in, oh, I don't know if it was February, March, something like that. But we were in the middle of the budget season and uh, told them, let's let's kind of get the, uh, the budget season largely behind us uh, before we follow through on an invitation that they had made to um, to come and brief the council and talk about, you know, new, new things that WRTD is trying to do to improve its services to our community. And obviously they, they are an important partner in, in our sort of transportation scheme in the region. And uh, so I wanted to give them an opportunity to at least have a, a brief meet and greet and audience with the council and maybe reopen lines of communication. So uh, Linda, I'll turn it over to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Good, I never know when my microphone's on. I don't know if any of you guys have that problem. That every time I think I'm speaking, I'm not speaking. <laughs> so first, I want to say thank you so much for allowing us this time. And uh, I enjoyed meeting with Ryan. And uh, thank you, Ryan, so much for that introduction. And yes, I am very new. I am just a little over a year at WRTD. And I did come from Texas, um, moved here last year. Um, I'm here with my daughter who came up and graduated high school just a few days ago at Manchester High School. And so it's been kind of tumultuous. And I am, um, you know, like Ryan probably in his, because I know when I met with him, he was also very new. And just kind of putting your feet on the ground and just kind of trying to wrap your arms around the whole project of everything. 
So it's it's been a year and COVID did not make it easy at all, I will say, is that trying to provide uh, public transportation during that period of time was a, truly a challenge um, because we were at work every day. All of our drivers were there. We had to scramble very quickly to try to adapt and make a safe environment for passengers. Um, but there was not a day that we did not provide transportation. So um, just as far as COVID goes, uh, barriers um, were installed on all of our buses. Um, and we also made masks available to all uh, passengers, uh, mandated mask wearing. And it is also still mandated. I remember earlier someone was asking about or talking about uh, mask wearing and where it is mandated, but for public transportation, it's still mandated on public transit and at public transportation transfer centers. So for now, it's it's still mandatory on our vehicles. Um, we uh, deep clean our buses. Uh, it was disinfecting every day. We bought special defoggers that. Um, we treated the buses with every day and continue to do so. So, um, you know, I think overall, uh, in we have 16 full-time operators. And through the year, at first, we had several that were affected uh, and that were quarantined. But we only had two positive COVID cases during the entire pandemic up until this point. Uh, where people had to seek treatment um, and zero fatalities, which we're very, very grateful for. So it's been a tough year. Um, and as far as, you know, where we're going from here, and one of the reasons why we were reaching out to Ryan and to uh, town managers of all the towns that we serve is that since I am new, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce myself and whatever relationship that each town had with administrators with WRTD before, I just wanted to make sure and um, introduce myself and state that I'm here, that we want to hear what you have to say, that we want to be involved in your community, and that we recognize ourselves as partners with you. Um, we hope that we provide a service that's beneficial to the constituents of, of Mansfield, but, um, and just to the greater community at, at large. We recognize that all sorts of people use public transportation, both young, seniors, persons with disabilities, persons who may have lost their driver's license or are unable to drive. But those people all use public transportation to go to the doctor's offices and to stores and, and they benefit the community by being able to move around and be more independent. So uh, we appreciate all the support that Mansfield and every town gives us. And uh, we just wanted to come here, introduce ourselves. Uh, you'll meet Philip here in just a second, who is our planner. And he's a shared planner with the University of Connecticut. So he works half the time with WRTD and half the time with us. Um, because, you know, we're, we're intrinsic, um, both Yukon and Mansfield and Wyndham and, and this whole region. And so planning in that way um, is, is, it's appropriate that he be uh, a planner. Uh, and I know uh, we've worked together closely with lots of ideas that we'd like to present to help improve uh, on-time performance and also to improve um, and reduce the amount of time that people spend on buses, help them get to their destinations in a timely manner, and to be the most efficient and safe and reliable service that we can provide. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'll let Philip take the floor and introduce himself. Sure, sure. Uh, Philip Johnson. Um, I've been here a year and some change now. And I had some uh, background in California working for a couple of um, COGS, 
uh, the councils of governments and transportation. So it was some great background. I've enjoyed uh, the migration over here. Uh, despite people saying that it was a mild winter, that, that does worry me that people have said that. Um, some major projects that we've been working on are uh, the memorandum of agreement uh, with UConn between WRTD and UConn, as some of you may know. Um, we WRTD is taking over um, the operational side for UConn for transportation to run their buses. It's a huge project uh, that Linda, Wendy, um, and everybody is uh, undertaking. Um, a baby step, but a big step we completed recently is uh, bringing the maintenance in-house. Um, we actually have uh, a new staff member here. Um, I believe his name is Brock, who's um, the in, in the maintenance bay. We're getting a lot of hardware open. So that's exciting to see a new boot on the ground and see some, see some major progress in the first step towards the merger, as we're calling it. Um, some other major updates to share with you is the intermodal center at Wyndham. Uh, that parking garage that's getting built, our routes are going to uh, take use of that, take advantage of it, and they'll, depending on the outreach and depending on the transportation model that we're putting the data into, we'll likely uh, have our buses begin to launch from the new intermodal center at Wyndham. Um, and that will change, that'll have an impact on, on times and schedules and operations and so forth. And uh, let's see, another major thing I wanted to share, the Peter Pan, they may be running a bus to Providence which is, I thought, a major piece of news to share that hasn't been officially approved yet. Uh, CT um, Transit is doing some, some outreach um, and we'll see if that gets programmed in, but it looks likely um, right now. And we just got six shiny new uh, vehicles. So you may see some, some new vehicles out on, on the street. We're constantly, you know, we got a big problem here or not really a problem, a challenge. Um, with the older vehicles that we had where we were rotating them in, switching them back and forth between fixed route and dial ride and dial ride and fixed route. And it's it's a great relief um, to have the six new vehicles through the efforts that Linda and everybody else has put in over um, the last year. So those are a few small things I wanted to share. Thank you for your time and thank you for allowing me to uh, introduce myself, Linda. Yeah, thank you, Philip. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing. Philip is also working on some uh, service changes. Uh, he and I are working together, but it's mostly uh, ideas that he has to improve the service uh, that we have in Mansfield uh, in better use of the Stores Willimantic route. Uh, we're looking at ways to increase the number of visits that we make to the senior center and the community center um, so that, you know, people can get where they need to go more often and it's less ride time. So that is, those are all things that we're putting in place right now. We haven't done our public outreach yet. You'll see that within the next couple of months. Uh, we wanna make sure that we give the public plenty of time to review the changes. Um, we'll make sure and send those to the board as well. Um, to let you guys review those and give us your comments and, and help us understand. We have one perspective, but we're really interested in hearing the perspective of the board to say where you feel like um, WRTD could better serve your community. Um, we want to open up that channel of communication and make sure that we're hearing you and that we can respond. I'm not sure that you've had that in the past and won't speak to reasons why. I just know that um, for me and for the crew that I work with now uh, that our interest is in, we understand who our, our customers are and we wanna make sure and touch base with you guys and be there for you and, and come to the board meetings and be there to answer questions, be there to answer concerns and hopefully get a few compliments, by the way, I hope. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that I touch base with you all and then uh, be here. If you guys have any questions, 
I don't ever promise to have all the answers to everything that you might ask me immediately, but I do respond. So anything you ask me, if I can't answer it immediately, then I will have that answer to you within a short period of time. So I'll open the floor now to board member responses or questions uh, that you'd like to put forward that we might be able to respond to. Council members? Ms. I don't have a question so much as I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for coming and that uh, it's really great to hear the message that you bring to us. We share your belief that, tra or I share your belief, and I don't want to speak for everybody, uh, that transportation is really important and that it's, it's a real equity, diversity, and inclusion issue. And as we seek to make our town um, more diverse, more inclusive, um, uh, a place with more equity, that thinking about transportation is key to that future. I know that there have been communities, particularly our aging community and our disability community uh, that had concerns with the last uh, group of management, we'll call them. So it's wonderful uh, for you to uh, be here and for this store to be open. And I really look forward uh, to a terrific future. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Shaker. Terry. Mr. Shaker. Thanks. Um, perhaps it's just because I, I haven't been paying as much attention as I should, but I <clears throat> the, the news of the sort of merger between WRTD and the Yukon's um, transit department is news to me and I'm wondering if you could share some more details about about it. It's an interesting idea and I think it sounds like a really a really good one. So I'm curious if you could share more details. Thank you for asking. Uh, yes. And that is, I will say, uh, a big part of the reason that drew me from Texas to here. Um, in Texas, I was working for a transportation agency in the town of Denton, Texas. Um, that is, you know, maybe a little bit larger than uh, Mansfield and, and uh, Wyndham, kind of in that area, but not much. And so they had a city route and they also provided transportation for the University of North Texas. And I was there for 16 years. And so uh, I saw this opportunity to come up here when I heard about this merger and it, I, it really fascinated me with what they were doing. Um, it, it's uh, My understanding is that they looked at this from a perspective of it's a combination of things. First of all, I believe that the University of North Texas wants to get out of the transportation business. You know, that they, they their parking and the other things that they have to do, uh, that is just overwhelming. And it's not unusual for our universities to want to um, escape from public transit because it's it's a chore. It's a it's a real um, challenge in a way. Uh, and so, the, also the Department of Transportation, which also funds us, uh, in addition to what we receive from our local cities, is that they said, "Wow, these agencies are only seven miles apart. Why do we have two agencies that are so close together providing transportation?" So what can we do to combine them? What are we going to have to invest? So Department of Transportation is, you know, first of all, in, um, in inviting myself and Philip, who have experience in these areas, and hopefully we can, you know, head this, is that um, they're funding this, is that the building is going to be expanded, the building at WRTD, which you've ever been over there, it's a nice building, but it's rather small. Um, but in the next three years, uh, construction will be uh, undertaken and they will double the size of that building. Uh, all of the Yukon buses and staff will move to WRTD and they will become WRTD employees and the vehicles will be DOT slash WRTD vehicles. But we all understand, and we work very, very closely with UConn uh, to understand that this is going to have to happen incrementally. 
So on August 1st, we're going to start the maintenance part of it. So we're right now, uh, there was a maintenance bay that was built five years ago that was never used. So that's part of what Philip brought out is that we're bringing on staff to head that and hiring technicians and uh, implementing and, and uh, putting equipment in there so that we can maintain the con vehicles. So that happens August 1st. We take that over. And then uh, right now, there's a company that their DOT is um, contracted with that will construct the building. And they will, uh, I think they're going to start construction probably within the next, oh, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 months when they break ground. We'll have to continue providing transportation out of that building. Um, the buses and the staff will remain on the Yukon campus until the construction is complete. And then probably, um, and well, we figure in about two and a half years, the construction will be complete. All the Yukon buses will be over at 28 South Frontage Road uh, in Mansfield Center. And then the staff will be there and WRTD will have that all under their umbrella. But it's very incremental. Any follow-up? Yes. yes, sir. The Katzenberger. Thank you. And Linda, welcome to Connecticut. Um, Thank you. It's uh, it's good to have you. One, it may not have been worked out yet, but what are the what will be anticipated the employment rights of, of people, you know, of drivers and others who are currently full time at UConn once they are transitioned over, or will they be transitioned over to uh, right. transit system? Right, and and you know that was one of my first questions uh, when I was meeting with uh, Dwight at the University of Connecticut. Um, and he and I were both very concerned, mostly concerned with the people um, because it's not just vehicles and it's not just building because you can't do that, you know, without the people to do it. So one of the first things that I did was uh, seek the counsel of a labor attorney that we have working for us under because I'm a first transit manager. And so we have very good labor attorney that works for us. And I sent her that question to say, you know, to pose this, this question to say, yes, all right, we're absorbing this group of people uh, that are currently uh, represented. And so what will be the um, possibilities for WRTD? And uh, our labor attorney, who I think the world of, I think she's really brilliant, uh, sent back some scenarios, three or four different scenarios, to say that, you know, basically, it, it you know, and I want to be careful not to commit, because until something happens, you can't say what is. You just have to say what the possibilities are. So in all those ways is that if people want to be represented, they will continue to be represented. So, you know, whether they work for WRTD or for UConn, uh, if that's what they choose, then WRTD will be prepared to honor uh, and to negotiate with, I think, it's the Teamsters now that um, represent that, that union over there. So uh, without going into too much detail, is that we're, we're aware of our responsibilities, we're prepared to honor whatever um, contracts and to negotiate in good faith. Uh, your, sorry, it seems your employees currently are not unionized then. No, they are not unionized. I believe um, historically, and what I've been told is that they had an opportunity at one point, um, but they chose not to be. And okay. that's not the case with the operators at um, UConn. And so, you know, that's a challenge. And that's one of the biggest questions um, that I'm, I'm faced with. And I generally believe that the best answer for anything is just candor, is to say, you know, these are the possibilities, but we have to wait. And it's up to 
the operators to decide. It's not for WRTD to decide or DOT, but if they choose to be represented, then certainly uh, WRTD is willing and able to negotiate in good faith. It just thank you for that. Uh, just one follow up, if I may, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Um, so even before that, do you have a sense of will every employee, current full time employee, be you know offered a similar position at WRTD in a couple of years? I have no reason to believe that they would not. I believe that you know, well, from what I've seen as far as our org charts and. Because the number of routes remain the same. You know, the, the WRTD, we have a certain number of routes. We have a certain number of drivers. Uh, UConn, same thing. Uh, they have a certain number of supervisor positions, driver positions, dispatch positions. And those people all um, hold those positions. And I think that's one thing that um, when I came here, I had already been through this. I'd been through this in Denton because we changed from one company to another and there was a contract with one company that transitioned over to another company. So I've already been through that transition process with individuals and um, I have that under my belt knowing um, how that transition can take place. From a human resource standpoint, is that there are certain things that we have to do to protect those individuals. And so, you know, it may be, it seems like a thing. Will they have to apply for the job? Well, yeah, as far as paperwork goes, you know, they have to go from one company to another. Will there be an application? Yes, but they're qualified for the job. You know, they'll, they'll transition over to that job. Um, so in saying that, there's no reason that the individuals who are working now would not transition over to WRTD. Thank you. Further questions? I, I have a question. One of the real issues on transportation in Mansfield has been transportation for seniors, particularly those living in the area near the university. Uh, well, as far as, uh, what do you mean as far as issues go? People complain. They don't get, can't get to doctors on time. It takes too long. There's no bus. There's no, I'm sure anybody who's worked with dial or ride where any length of time knows what the complaints are. So my question is, if WRTD takes over UConn's bus route, will those buses is there a potential for those buses to make longer circuits where they go through town and pick up other people, or are they going to be limited to UConn students? Well, from right now, you will not see a difference. UConn routes will remain on UConn, and WRTD routes will remain WRTD routes. Although, as I said before, Philip. Um, has presented many excellent ideas for improving the amount of uh, times that a bus goes through a certain area. Um, he's also invested in, we've also invested in, he presented it, but as an agency, uh, we've invested in a company called T-Best, which is going to give us some really accurate information that's based on uh, socioeconomic and um, so it's a planning software where they've taken statistics from um, uh, demographics, from um, census and different agencies so that when we plan, we can actually plan with information. Like we know we're going into areas that need the transportation. So we're trying to improve uh, the intelligence with which we make these, these um, decisions. So, and as far as the, I, what I get is that I think uh, that a few years ago that WRTD went through some changes. Um, and my understanding is they were very short staffed. They weren't able, they were denying dial a ride. Um, and I'm not sure why, but I understand a lot of the complaints happened over, you know, a couple of years ago. 
Um, but as far as their, um, their rides and the amount of time that they're on the bus, I had this brought up at one of the board meetings for WRTD. And I specifically asked uh, my transportation director to research the statistics to tell me what was the average time that a passenger spent on the bus. And so statistically over the last, I want to say it was two years, she went back two years and the average amount of time that the passenger spent on the bus was no more than 22 minutes. Now that's average. That's not to say that there weren't occasions when someone was on a bit longer or someone was on less, but the average time was only 22 minutes on the vehicle. So um, complaints, when I speak about complaints, the thing is, and I'm very frank, I will tell you when I'm getting complaints, I will tell you. And honestly, I'm not receiving them through WRTD. If there are complaints, they're not being submitted through the channels that allow us to address them. So if you're getting complaints, I would, would um, appreciate, just urge them to go through info at WRTD. Give them my personal number. I, Ryan has my personal cell phone number. I would be happy to address any issues that anyone has immediately. So I'm hoping that a lot of the complaints that you may be referring to are things that, that are older, that may already have been resolved. Thank you. Uh, I, we will definitely keep track of that. Um, uh, I've been a volunteer driver for our senior volunteer driver program. And of course, we haven't driven anybody for the last 15 months. So <laughs> I don't know, but I was on occasion hearing some of the difficulties that people had. And I will keep my ears open as the as folks come in. Any Absolutely. Other questions? Any other questions? All right. Hearing none, thank you very much for coming to talk to us, and we look forward to a long-lasting relationship. <laughs> thank you so much. It's important thank to our team. Thank you, everybody. Okay, that thank email you. address that Linda mentioned is info at wrtd.org, and it's monitored by three different people um, just to share the email address. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You Good night. All right. Now, Animal Control Department. In keeping with um, a tradition we, we've started in recent months, um, it's been a while, I believe, since the council's heard directly from our Animal Control Officer, Naran Nielsen. And so... Um, going to turn it over to her in a moment, but I do have a very short uh, PowerPoint slide deck that uh, I'll be uh, operating for Naran, and I'm just going to pull that pulled up for you. All right, over to you, Naran. Good evening, town council members, Madam Mayor. Uh, everybody can hear me? We can. Yeah, okay, perfect. So I would like to give a short uh, update about the animal control department. Here you see our building. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about what we exactly do, because not everybody knows that. Um, Animal control officers in Connecticut are sworn uh, law enforcement officers. And we, uh, our main focus is on uh, the enforcement of the state animal control laws. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, kittens. Um, then we follow the state protocols. And those protocols are important to protect uh, the residents from rabies. And then we also enforce uh, the town ordinances, which our main town ordinance is the mandatory cat spay neuter ordinance that I worked on uh, back in 2006. Now, as a result of, of um, enforcing these ordinances, we have to 
uh, impound stray roaming and abandoned pets. So because we have these animal control laws, we also need a shelter. We need a place uh, to bring the shelter pets. Um, the last year, things were a bit different at the shelter because during the pandemic, the, the adoption uh, demands increased tremendous, tremendously. Everybody was staying at home. Uh, they had the time to spend with a pet. And uh, we received daily phone calls. Do you have pets up for adoption? So as a result, the pets went home uh, rather quickly. And on the other side, we took in less pets. So as a result, we were constantly empty. And on Facebook, you saw a lot of pictures of uh, shelters with empty cages. So in a way, that's great. But then, because that has been our goal all along, to have no pets in the shelter. But then once it happens, it's actually very weird to come to a shelter where there are no uh, dogs barking, because that's just uh, business as usual for us. And uh, we do expect um, that now when uh, pet owners go back to their offices and they have less time for their pets, that our intake of pets will increase. And we already see that a little bit. Now, on the downside, because people spend so much time with their pets, uh, dog bites have doubled. Um, and also in Mansfield, uh, which, which also makes sense, um, because if you spend a lot of time with your pets, then things can go wrong. Now I want to touch quickly on the state of our animal control building, and that's why we did this slideshow, because I want to show you. Yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is our um, animal shelter in Mansfield. It's a cinder block building, and we think it was built in the 60s. We don't know exactly. We have 10 dog kennels and we have nine cat cages. Um, regarding the size of the dog kennels, we are grandfathered in. The size should be uh, 40 square feet. We are just under that. Um, we, we, have to, we have a very cramped space. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, this is actually our combined kitchen, bathroom, and utility room. And in this room, this is our, our only sink in the building. And this is where we have to do all our dishes. Uh, we have frequent repairs uh, because of water leaks. We just had um, our water heater broke down. So that was replaced. I have that in the next slide. If you go to the next slide. To the left, that's our new water heater. And we even have a cat cage in here, which is not really a quarantine area, but it's a little bit away from the other cages. But if we really have to quarantine a cat, we have to actually bring the cat in the office. So what we really need at the shelter is at least a kitchen and then a separate bathroom. And we also need a a quarantine area for the cats because we currently do not have one. Um, if you move over to the next slide, okay, there then because the bu building is older, we have um, cracks in the walls, and then you can say, well, no big deal, we can just fix that. This crack was fixed so many times, but just after a while, it just keeps coming back. And the problem is that it's not sanitary. It's uh, bacteria can easily grow in there because we cannot disinfect in the, in the crack. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. Um, this is a dog that we currently have at the shelter. Uh, her name is Luna. She's a Pitsky. That's a pit bull husky mix. Um, we hope to find her a home very soon. So that's why I thought want to take the opportunity, maybe maybe somebody is in, in the market for this dog. And then this coming Saturday, we have our low-cost rabies clinic at the Eagleville Firehouse 
in Mansfield from 10 to noon. We're very excited because last year we couldn't have it because of COVID. So we hope that this year will be a big success. So that was my update. And if you have any questions, then just let me know. Thank you, Naran. Um, I know Tony, uh, uh, I think has frequent meetings or frequent stops at the, uh, the shelter as an avid cat enthusiast. Um, I just want to say that in, in my short time here, visiting with Naran over at the shelter and, and, you know, coming to understand some of the things that she's been through in the course of her, her work. Um, I just want to do a public shout out to her for her enthusiasm for this work. She's incredibly passionate about the animal she works with. And, um, you know, especially given that it hasn't been clear sailing in all her time there, she's endured some things that nobody should have to go through in the course of that job. It's just really just a testament to her and her commitment uh, to her profession. And so uh, I, I applaud that. I think she's a real asset to our community. But uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to field any questions or comments folks have. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bruder. Yes, I also wanted to, you know, say thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I know uh, firsthand with my uh, daughter-in-law who has worked with you guys, some of the difficulties that you have to, you know, do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, and I didn't realize that the, the kitchen and the bathroom were, were one like that, um, you know, and, and certainly that this may be something that, you know, in the future that we put as wanting to, to be addressed, you know, I know the budget season is coming to a close and all that, but, um, it's my understanding too, that, um, your office is probably could use like another computer or maybe another desk or something like that but yeah uh, i could come up with a whole list but <laughs> i wanted yeah. to eat you guys into it well thank you for that <laughs> and thank you for the <laughs> and on uh, the theme that sam just brought up i'd, I'd be remiss if i didn't say so Naran and i do have um periodic conversations about the condition of her facility i think anybody with a pair of operating eyes and um, can apply basic logic to it, see, sees the, the many problems that exist. And so um, the, the, the future of the facility and any plans for the facility um, and, and the animal control operation in general clearly is something that, um, you know, that's a can that can't be kicked down the road uh, too much further. And so I do suspect to Sam's point that, um, you know, as we embark on this this season or this, this, this year with uh, some money that will hopefully be uh, ultimately approved in the budget for this facilities study that we're talking about. Um, hopefully that'll help answer some of these key questions too about the future of the animal control facility. So. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I have one. What kind of, why would you quarantine an animal? Uh, you want to quarantine an animal when they're sick. And especially with cats, it's a pro big problem because a lot of the cats that are abandoned, they have upper respiratory infection, and that's an airborne disease. So we can absolutely not put them in a tiny cat room because all the cats would get upper respiratory infection. And once they have upper respiratory infection, they cannot be vaccinated, they cannot be spayed and neutered. So then I cannot uh, adopt them out. And because my shelter is so small, it's it's very important that I move the animals ASAP so that I that means adopt them out so that I can make room for the next animals. So that's why that's important. Okay, my second question is: Have you been seeing rabies and wild animals in the last year or so? Yes, we it constantly happens. We had a rabbit skunk not too long ago on Stores Road. Um, yeah, and we had before that we had a rabbit bat. Yeah, but we on a regular basis we still have rabbit animals, and that's why we educate the, the residents of the importance of to keep their pets up to date on rabies. Okay, and to be alert to the to rabbit animals, I would guess. Yes, but uh, if it's uh, there are lots of rabbit animals out there, but you wouldn't even see them because they are nocturnal and they're out at night. But yeah, sometimes we see at the tip of the iceberg, we see, yes. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for the work you do. 
I know you took very good care of the two guys I adopted. So um, thank you once again. We look forward to hearing from you on an, on an annual basis. And the, the <laughs> data that were appended to this report will give you a much better idea of the amount of work that our animal control officer does. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, next item is the MRRA single family, multifamily transfer station rates. And I think that before we consider this, the council needs to make itself the Mansfield Resource Recovery Council. Uh, Mr. Shaken. I move that we recess the town council and convene as the Mansfield Resource Recovery Authority. There's second. Give Ruder seconds. Does anybody object to doing this? Then I rule we are now the Mansfield Resource Recovery Authority. Um, Mr. Aylesworth? Um, yes, we have uh, staff representative Virginia uh, Walton, our recycling coordinator, and um, uh, Julia Sherman from the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. But before I segue to them, I want to give the floor to John Carrington, our esteemed DPW director, who you all will remember has a day named after him. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of stunned there. Uh, <laughs> so the Solid Waste Advisory Committee also uh, called the SWAC short. Uh, they've looked at the trash and recycle fees. Uh, most fees have not changed since I've been with the town. You know, in 2013, Willamette Waste Paper took over the single family contract. Uh, some of those contract costs have gone up and we know now that we used to get money for recycling and now recycling costs money to get rid of. So there's some changes we need to make and I'll turn it over to the, uh, my expert in trash and recycling, uh, Ginny Walton. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, so what you have before you is a request to increase fees at um, for some of the single family service, multifamily service, and at the transfer station. Um, those are the three cost centers that we use when we're figuring out um, the budget for the solid waste fund. So I'll just go over the rationale behind um, each of the, the changes, not each change, but the changes for those cost centers. So starting with single family service. Um, so we use unit-based pricing for single family service. Um, and in order for unit-based pricing to work effectively, there needs to be enough of a price difference between the different service sizes to encourage recycling, waste prevention, and composting. And we've been, the town has been doing that since 1990. And since that time, um, it's been very steady. The, the smaller service sizes, which are the 20 gallon and 35 gallon service sizes have been the largest share of the subscriptions. Um, the other sizes, the 64 gallon, the 96 gallon and 160 gallon services have had a smaller share. And what has happened in the past three years, and this is not necessarily pandemic related, this is happening before the pandemic, was the 64, 96 and 160 gallon service sizes um, were getting a larger share of subscriptions. So it, it was enough of a, it's been slow, but it's enough of a shift and there's enough of a change that it really has caused the Solid Waste Advisory Committee to re-examine the pricing, see if there's enough of a cost difference. Um, so the, um, the pricing that you see, the requested pricing changes that you see are for increasing the 64, 96, and 160 gallon services. And that is based on 
uh, best, some best management practices of how much to increase service sizes. So uh, for a doubling of a service size, um, you want to charge about 50 to 80% more than the, the base charge. Um, then for multifamily, we revisited the recycled dumpster services uh, because as um, John had mentioned, the cost of recycling has risen. We used to get paid for it and now we're being charged for it. So that just needs to be reevaluated. And then at the transfer station, there were some uh, changes that needed to be made to reflect upcoming contract changes. And also the solid, at the same time, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee suggested that the price per bag rise from $3.50 a bag to $4 a bag. Um, the price at the transfer station has not changed since 2003. So um, those are the requested changes. And uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask me. Mr. Bruder. Thank you, Jenny, so much for the uh, the information and for all the work that you do for our town. Uh, I just had a question on the recommendation for uh, the charge for motor oil and antifreeze. Um, I know that it's it's not a lot. I don't know. Was it? Has there been any discussion? Uh, is, I'm assuming that this is because that we're going to be charged for it. Yes. And was there any discussion in terms of trying to? Um, I don't know. I, I get my concern is that people, instead of uh, having the convenience of being able to drop it off, will just burn it in their backyard instead, um, throw it in the ground type deal. Um, the, the recommendation from um, um, the transfer station supervisor was that uh, um, there's more and more people bringing several gallons worth of oil. So uh, the, the question was, is that coming from a residence or is it coming from a business, the quantities? So up to two gallons, there's no charge. Um, and, you know, oftentimes an oil change is what, five quarts of oil around. Um, so that'd be a little bit over a gallon. And, and then starting with the third gallon, be a dollar. So, yes, there was... There was somebody that had expressed concern um, about that as well, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee, but they did vote on approving, you know, passing on this charge for your consideration. And that's a really good point. I, I, I overlooked the over two gallons uh, part of that and uh, hadn't considered, uh, you know, maybe somebody's a mechanic and, and changing oil on the side type deal versus somebody just, just doing it on their own. Thank you. Sure. Oh, welcome, Alfred Tony, joining us. Um, Better late than never. <laughs> well, glad you're here. Um, you are our, our only Republican tonight. Everybody else is out sick, so I'm glad you're here. Um, Mr. Kachenberger? Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Virginia. I mean, this is you, you've been so devoted to this uh, area for many years. Um, one question on the uh, the change from generating to revenue to costing us some um, money for recycling is that uh, a statewide or nationwide phenomenon, or is there something unusual about Mansfield? It, no, it's nationwide. Yeah, it's it's global, actually. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's in part because of uh, China was taking a lot of our materials and uh, as a nation, it uh, wasn't really high quality material. So they, they said no more, you know, we don't want this stuff. Um, it's poor quality. And then, uh, so there have been, there's been a lot of end market scrambling um, to find homes for this material. So that's one piece, and um, and part of it is contamination. You know that there's um, there's too much stuff mixed in with the recycling that is trash. 
and needs to be sorted out. So um, that in, in the next piece that we'll be doing, we're asking that you approve some actions to help help improve that. Thank you. Okay, there is a, a motion on page 68, Mr. Bruder. I can make that motion, Mayor, if you'd like. As well. Resolved effective January 1st, 2022 to amend sections A196-12 subsection B, F, and G of the Mansfield Solid Waste Regulations to add the attached fees for trash and recycling services. Is there a second to Mr. Bruder's motion? Ms. Berthelot. Um, Mr. Bruder, Mr. Hatchemir, you're just a little too slow. <laughs> and just to speak in favor of my motion, uh, it, you know, I very much appreciate the work that uh, has gone into making these recommendations and certainly uh, the thought and um, uh, time as well. And I, for that, I hope everyone can approve. Any further comments on the motion? Is there anybody who wishes to abstain? Is there anybody who wishes to vote in the negative? All right, then I will rule that this motion has been adopted unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, the next, uh, the next motion. Uh, Mayor. Mr. Bruder. If I could, uh, I'd like to move that the council recess as the Mansfield Resource Recovery Authority and could reconvene as the town council. Is there a second? Ms. Berthelot seconds. So Mr. Fructone seconds. We have multiple seconds. Um, is there anybody who objects to going back to becoming the town council? All right, I rule that we have, are now the town council. The next motion is on page 78, and this is the motion that uh, directs the Solid Waste Advisory Committee to look into new ways of, uh, of expanding our recycling and reducing the weight that we have to pay to have handled. Um, by the way, uh, there uh, there was a request to the council a year or so ago to support a revised bottle bill. That bill did pass, or some version of it passed the General Assembly this year. Um, and I, I hope it met the needs and the wishes of the Solid Waste Advisory Council. There are quite a few elements of it, I think, that, that reflected the, the motion that we were uh, originally endorsed. So, um, Mr. Aylesworth, do we, should we speak to this motion first, or can we just go to a motion? Well, it is, it's a real, it's a, obviously a related theme. Um, I don't know if um, Ginny or Julia, you know, wanted to have some discussion about this or, or what their preference is. I mean, if, if the council is prepared to, to, to move on the proposed motion, um, that, that's certainly acceptable, but folks, oh, and Mayor Julia has been, Mayor Julia has been on the line the whole meeting. Could we ask SWAC to give us an overview? A short one, sure. perhaps, but an overview nonetheless of their activities and of this recommendation. Sure. Ms. Sherman, welcome, and thank you for having put up with this long meeting. We can't hear you. Her we phone's on mute. Somebody has to, okay. Oh, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. You have to. Uh, you have to unmute me. I think. No, you're unmuted now. Hear you. You're good. Oh, I am good. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for giving us the time to um, just give you some updates. If you're newer on the council, you may not know about uh, the Solid Waste Advisory uh, Committee. Um, you do have this in your packet, I think. So uh, I will be very short regarding what's on this, but there are some very important 
pieces that uh, we want to focus on. The committee is devoted to reducing the amount of waste uh, Manso produce, produces, and there is a goal of 80% of uh, reduction by 2030 for the state. Uh, we are one of the towns that is often in leadership when it comes to um, finding ways to reduce waste. And we were one of the, uh, the um, uh, towns that supported the breakthrough from plastic pollution resolution um, that uh, we've already had in the past. Um, we also um, became a, a near zero waste community in 2015. Uh, we were also one of the spearheads for the uh, uh, plastic bag ban and other towns followed right along with us and then the state took it over. So uh, I have to commend you all for supporting um, a lot of the uh, initiatives that we've had on SWAC and we're hoping that you will continue to support us in our future goals. Um, we we did come up with our, uh, uh, you know, our most recent goals uh, between December and May of this year um, and some of the, um, the highlights there just for you are that um, we are now running a ca uh, compost campaign. Um, uh, Ginny arranged for selling rain barrels and composting uh, um, uh, barrels for the town. And people, many people, Ginny could tell you how many people purchased, but it, it was very successful. We, we've had a, um, uh, a, a uh, campaign that... Uh, uh, at the farmer's market, and we've had a lot of foot traffic and a lot of people taking flyers as well as uh, taking compost kits that one, uh, several of our members have put together, um, free compost kits to show people how they can do this. Um, to, to reduce food, um, food in our trash would be very useful because it's very heavy. And, you know, as we pay, we do pay by tons. So if we can get people to compost, this is a great um, initiative for us. We also have updated our op Adopt the Road uh, program. Uh, people do go out and um, uh, begin to pick up uh, uh, some of the waste on some of our town roads to help with that. Um, there's always room for more, so if you know volunteers, please have them contact Jimmy um, so that the roads can be assigned. Uh, support low waste events, and we also support the repair cafe because we um, uh, reuse is way better than recycle. So uh, those are some of the things we're doing. We also helped Ginny to evaluate the trash rate, um, if you're not familiar with what we do at our meetings. Right now, um, this is very important. We need to capture more reusable um, uh, things at uh, the transfer station, and we want to return to the expansion of the use of reusable food service containers in our schools. Uh, we realized that during pandemic, people were giving them a lunch bag, just throw it away, and it was a lot of trash. We have to go back to um, hopefully um, uh, using washable uh, materials. We have water in the state of Connecticut, and certainly the new Southeast School has a ton of water underneath it, I can tell you, because I live next door. And we have a huge uh, amount of water available. So it's no problem for us to rewash. Um, so... Uh, uh, all I'm asking at this point is that um, oh, oh, we also we also are asking to um, uh, increase textile recycling and um, the uh, inspection of trash and recycle containers because people uh, are still having trouble uh, recycling correctly. Um, th there is no. Um, no, the town attorney says there's no problem with us checking for uh, what's in the recycle and the trash. Um, if there are any other questions that you'd like, I don't want, want to keep too long. The meeting is getting quite late. Um, if there are any other questions that you have for SWAC, uh, please share with them. With me personally, you can um, reach me uh, through the committee um, to Ginny, or you can ask Ginny. Ginny is the pro on this. And we are there to support and help and research and to dem disseminate information. Uh, that's what SWAC does. Um, any questions? Anyone have a question? Uh, I, see, I see Mr. Schoen, followed by Mr. Katchenberger, followed by Ms. Berthola. Could you discuss a little bit more uh, the inspection, the uh, container inspections? Who would do that? Under what circumstances? What is that about? Um, Julie, should I, I think I should probably yeah. speak 
Yes. So, um, <laughs> so I was hope I was hoping that we'd um, have a little bit of a budget for a part time person, but that didn't didn't happen for this coming fiscal year. So it would be me doing it. And um, I would probably try to dedicate a morning once a week um, in the fall and um, and coordinate with the trash company. So I would do it on trash collection day and pick uh, neighborhoods that I would go to. I'd be ahead of the truck. So this would be probably very early in the morning that I'd be doing this. Um, and I would use oops tags. So if there was, I would lift, it would be lift the lid, take a visual inspection of what's in the recycle container. If I see a few items in there, I would leave an oops tag, which is um, patterned after what the recycling partnership has created. And it, it would be um, uh, educational primarily. Yeah. So I, if, if I may just yeah. indicate my extreme discomfort with anyone going through people's trash. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be digging through it. It would be a visual look on the top. If people had private papers in their recycling bin, you would see them. Papers if they wish to recycle, but had their personal financial data or whatever in there. If it if it were on top of the bin, um, yeah. then yes, or I, private I, letters or whatever. Um, well, I think this is something we should ha have a further discussion on, or that SWAC might want to consider again. But you raise a very important point, uh, Mr. Kotchenberger. Thank you. And actually, that was um, going to be my point of question as well. And it's it's not, and you know, I, not any lack of, you know, I fully believe that Virginia would be, you know, very discreet, uh, as unobtrusive as possible. So it's not that. But I also, I don't feel, I mean, at least now, I could be educated on this, certainly, but I don't feel comfortable with having that, doing that kind of inspection. I, I would note that people should, if they have private financial or any kind of private documents, they should absolutely shred them, not because of anything about the town of Mansfield, but for other security reasons. But leaving that aside, I, I, I would support this motion if we could strip out, not you know, for further discussion, that recommendation. Are you making a, a motion to amend? Well, it has the motion hasn't been made yet. I got it. When the time comes, you will you may make a motion to amend. Ms. Berthold, Thank you. followed by Mr. Shaken. Yeah, I want to start out by reiterating uh, how important the work uh, of um, Virginia and Julia and for this town is, and how proud I was when I sat in a meeting. And Mansfield was second in the nation, just behind Portland, Maine, uh, in terms of how little garbage we're throwing away. That made me really, really proud. In the same breath, I have to share uh, Mr. Shuren and Mr. Kochenberg's concern about this particular issue. And though I, I know, of course, uh, that um, Virginia uh, would be absolutely discreet. I'm not comfortable with any town employee knowing, uh, possibly seeing personal papers, but also how much gin somebody's consuming, um, and you know all the other things that that one puts, you know, uh, puts in their recycling bin. And um, so I, w I would actually hope that we could find do more education more of a push on an education front, including, uh, as Ms. Walton, I think would correct me here, we shouldn't be putting our gin bottles in there at all. Uh, and um, that um, we should be, if we've got bottles that our glass should actually uh, be going back for the deposit rather than mixing it in. But that also, I, I support this generally speaking, but this particular piece I, I'm really also uncomfortable with. Mr. Shaken, I'll just remind the council <clears throat> that this has come up before, and 
It's something that the council has felt similar levels of discomfort with, I think the last time it came up, at least as I recall. Um, I, I, I tend to agree if you know, I understand the intention and certainly um, if you read enough cases of how crimes have been solved over the years, someone's trash out on the side of the road is, is legally fair game. And, and, and Ginny does act as our enforcement officer for violations of a number of, of solid waste related ordinances. And so, um, but I, I have to say, I think, um, I think there would be a substantial amount of discomfort felt by folks in the community to observe someone going through their trash before the bin, before the truck came. And, um, and I agree, I think there's got to be a better way to try to influence folks' decisions for what to recycle versus what to throw in the trash than, than these audits. And, and frankly, a way that might cause more widespread community um, adoption of different behaviors, given how difficult it would be to cover the whole town with this audit process in a, in a relatively short period of time. So. Um, I'm hopeful there's a way that we can address this in a broader way. If there's a way that we can work with the trash company to inspect a, you know, a truck after it's gone through a several neighborhoods and maybe target areas of town where there are issues, um, if, there, if that is the case. I just, I'm, I'm also uncomfortable with, um, with the town conducting the audits in this, in this way, at least without a lot of advanced notice and warning to people, which probably negates sort of the idea. So um, I am in support of the rest of this motion as it's been proposed. And so um, I think we need to have a further discussion and figure out a better way to, to conduct these audits in a way that makes, sort of deals with some of those concerns. Mr. Bruder. I'm prepared to make the motion I think that would be supported by the town council if you would think that's appropriate at this time, Mayor. Okay. I move to direct the Solid Waste Advisory Committee on behalf of the town to promote residential composting and work with staff to capture more reusable items entering the transfer station, support the return to and expansion of the use of re reusable food service in the schools, uh, assist the schools in the return of co uh, to composting, and finally expand access to textile recycling. And how about the solid waste audit? I, I, uh, I took that to be part of the audit of the ins with inspections. If that's not true, then I can certainly amend my, my motion. Um, Ms. Walton, is that part of the of the inspections? No, it would be what um, I think Ben had or, or Ron had suggested that it would be like after, at the end of the route on a Thursday, for instance, it would be an audit of what came in out of the truck. Okay, so. So if I could, Mayor, um, uh, <clears throat> where I left off on expand access to textile recycling, I'd like to add or to include uh, and conduct a solid waste audit as we discussed. Is there, a, is there a second to Mr. Bruder's motion? Ms. Berthold seconds. Mr. Bruder, you want to discuss your motion? Uh, I think that enough discussion has been had, and I really appreciate the work that's gone into allowing us to have this discussion tonight. Anybody else who wishes to discuss this motion? Is there anybody who wishes to abstain? Is there anybody who wishes to vote in the negative? Hearing no objection, I will declare this motion has been adopted unanimously. And I would like to extend the council's thanks to SWAC and its volunteers and to Virginia Walton for all the work they have done. <clears throat> I've got to say, it was really nice to have the swap shop reopened, and uh, I have a couple of things that are waiting for the repair cafe. So, as soon as that gets open, we'll all be uh, that'll all be good news. Um, 
Okay, the next item on the agenda is um, the proclamation. Mr. Aylesworth, whoever wrote this proclamation did a really nice job. So would you uh, introduce the proclamation? I'd be happy to, and all the credit for the proclamation uh, authorship goes to Tasha Smith. Um, the, the brief introduction here is uh, come to my attention that um, I think shortly before, perhaps right before I came on as town manager um, with the uh, unfortunate passing of Michael uh, Jungden, one of the owners of the Mansfield Drive-In, the council had expressed interest, or members of the council had expressed an interest in uh, recognizing um, Michael for the importance of, of the, the drive-in. And as things have progressed uh, with, with us uh, navigating the pandemic, uh, the conversation has since turned to actually recognizing um, the drive-in and what the drive-in has meant to Mansfield as a community and also by extension, um, you know, Michael's obviously a really important role in, in you know, getting, getting the drive-in off the ground and operating it all these years. Um, so, Madam Mayor, I don't know if, if you want this read into the record, how you want to proceed. Uh, well, my suggestion would be that we adopt it for tonight and that at our next, our first in-person meeting, we invite members of the family that is operating the drive-in to come in and that we present a full proclamation to them at that time. Sound, sounds reasonable. Does anybody object to that? Does anybody object? Uh, wait a minute, somebody needs to move the adoption of the proclamation. Um, Mr. Bruder moves it, Ms. Bertha Lott seconds. Uh, is there anybody who objects to this, to this proclamation being adopted? All right, this proclamation has been adopted unanimously and we will uh, extend an invitation and, and maybe a one of our 10 minute ceremonies before the council convenes at our first in-person meeting uh, or whenever the family is available uh, to make the, to award the proclamation directly. So thank you one and all. And to Tosh Smith and Margaret Chady who have who actually drafted it. Um, okay, the next item is council committees. Um, personnel, have you anything to report? No, Mayor, we've not met since the last meeting. Finance? Uh, the same, and of course we have the town meeting tomorrow uh, for the uh, vote on the budget. Thank you. Uh, and Committee on Committees and Ad Hoc Housing. We did meet, uh, the Committee on Committees met this past Thursday and uh, got a number of great volunteers uh, interviewed and, and, on, and on board uh, to make a recommendation. I don't know, now that I say that, um, uh, we did not, I guess, bring that to this town council meeting, but we will uh, for the next one. Um, I also want to say that we're working on the human services advisory uh, charge so that uh, we hope, you know, at our next meeting in July to, to go over some draft language uh, that we uh, think we have an agreement on in terms of trying to, to streamline it and, and encourage more uh, particip participation type deal. Um, for the ad hoc committee on affordable housing, we recently closed our survey. Uh, we did not get quite the, the same level of input, but we still got um, a, a fair amount. Uh, I think it was about 150 for this round where we were asking, you know, how do we fund the, the trust? You know, and all this extra money that's coming in for pilot and all these things, you know, maybe that can be looked at but um, also, uh, you know, how to prioritize it. And the, um, the agenda, the plan is to have a public hearing, uh, which we'll advertise. And um, before that public hearing, we'll go through the survey results, have the public hearing where people can comment and, you know, add additional input. So if you didn't get a chance to do the survey, you can still give your input. Um, 
and that'll be coming up and we'll be advertising that. Thank you. Um, Department and advisory committee reports. Anything on petitions, requests, and communications? Um, I'm operating with two computers here. Future agendas. Mr. Kotterberg. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think this would be a, a way to start the agenda item is if we could ask, um, I think it would be IT, but perhaps in social service, but several departments, I think it would be very useful to get a sense of the extent to which people are, don't have access or have limited access to broadband internet. I mean, we know this is a very important issue over the last year, uh, but it's, it's gonna, you know, even with the return to in-person schooling, it's increasingly important that, that we have this access. Um, and I would it would be useful in part to know how we can to improve it in the future with the possibility that we may have some funds to do so, but to understand the magnitude or, of the problem. Um, can we put this in the sense, in the terms of getting a recommendation from our IT department about what we need to do about expanding broadband coverage? Or do you want the research first? Um, well, I, I mean, I think we need to know a little more about, I mean, if, well, I mean, either one is fine. I think ideally we know, have some view of the extent of the problem because that'll then tell us, um, you know, what, you know, possible solutions, whether it's, you know, uh, increased access at various hotspots or improving internet access at, at residences. So I think that information would be helpful beforehand, but, uh, you know, that's uh, either way, I think it would be a, a, a necessary piece of information to have. Mr. Ailsworth? Yeah, I, I think um, Mr. Kochenberger's uh, um, comments are, are, are very well taken, very timely. I, I probably should take this as an opportunity to let the council know that um, in addition to um, the ongoing uh, brainstorming and prioritization, if you will, that we're doing internally right now at the staff level as far as um, possible projects that we could utilize uh, our forthcoming uh, rescue plan funds, um, we recently... Uh, became aware through through Representative uh, Haddad um, of some, um, it's actually ARPA funds, but it's money going to the state. And there was about a 48-hour turnaround, 72-hour turnaround over the Memorial Day weekend. This is how short it was that we had to react uh, relative to um, um, mo mobile uh, mobile access, or, or sorry, um, uh, high-speed internet access, but also uh, specifically related to wireless uh, hotspots. And so I'd be happy to share with the council um, what uh, Jamie Russell and, and the folks in IT, because I brought this to Jamie's attention right away, and I asked him what we could do. And um, in, in very impressive uh, short period of time and over a holiday weekend, his team pulled together a, a very meaty proposal um, that uh, spoke to how we would enhance or provide um, high-speed uh wireless access in um, many different public locations, places like uh, the playground outside the community center, um, Bicentennial uh, Pond, um, a variety of different locations where we see the public kind of gathering. Maybe there's people with children, uh, they want to be able to multitask, have their kids playing while they work on a job application or something of that sort. Um, and so we put in a funding request specifically for that. Um, and it also included uh, procurement of some um, devices and kiosks that we would make available to people, um, again, at, at sort of publicly controlled locations, um, town properties, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, so your comments are very well taken and, and we're certainly trying to make progress in that front, but we're also studying the broader question that you raise, um, of high-speed wireless or high-speed internet access, um, throughout the community and what part pockets of town are currently underserved. So maybe Mr. Kachenberger's uh, request could be modified to say, when you have a report, please let us know about it. Yeah, it's definitely being heavily studied. It's, a, it's definitely a source of conversation. I'll talk with Jamie, and we'll come up with a game plan when we think it would be a good, a good time to come back to the council with some updates. That, no, that would, that's fine. That would be great. And again, while I... 
depends in part on the limitations of money or, we, or the increased pilot. But I, I think this is something we have, you know, we have potentially the resources if this is where we chose to make it, to have um, a high-speed internet access available to everyone. Uh, and that, I think, would be very, very important. But, uh, but I, you know, the materials that uh, Jamie and staff are doing are gathering, which will be a helpful start to that, you know, to figuring out whether and, you know, how much it would cost to do so. Okay, any other items for future agendas? And the next item on our agenda is a motion, a very important motion, to adjourn. Mr. Aylesworth. Just a reminder to members of the council uh, who haven't yet had an opportunity to complete my six-month evaluation. Thank you in advance for taking the time to do that. Appreciate your feedback. Okay, and, and one reminder, the town meeting for tomorrow is at 6 o'clock. It is not at our normal time, but it is at 6 o'clock. And we will see you all at the at the Mansfield Middle School. Thank you, one and all. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. Shaken makes it. Mr. Bruder seconds it. Is there anybody who objects to adjourning? No. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.